What's up? I'm Vin, and today I'm going through the 2024 Grade 6 New York Math Test, and I'll leave a link to a copy of this test in the description below. Now let's get started. Question 2. Which expression represents 5 more than the product of 2 and y? So for something like this, we have to know what these words mean in terms of math operations. More than tells us that we're going to be adding, and then the product tells us that we're going to be multiplying. So now we just read this again. 5 more than means we're going to be doing plus 5 here. So we have 5 plus, or I could say plus 5 at the end. And the product tells us to multiply 2 and y. So I'm doing 2 times y. But when I want to multiply 2 and y, I don't actually have to put the time sign between them. 2y like this means 2 times y. So I could keep that multiplication sign invisible. And now I look to the answer key and see this is going to match up with choice B. Now you might be looking at that and saying, wait, these don't match exactly, but Based on the commutativity of addition, we could flip the order here and say that this is equal to 2y plus 5 as well. So choice B is our answer. Question 3, which value of B makes the inequality 3B is greater than 12 true? So for this one, what we could do is we could just solve this inequality with one step. So we have 3 times B is greater than 12. And to get rid of times 3, we do the opposite of multiplying by 3 which is dividing by 3. So I'm going to divide both sides of this inequality by 3. And now 3 divided by 3 cancels, and we have b is greater than 12 divided by 3 is 4. So now just ask yourself which of the answer choices gives us a number that is greater than 4. And that's going to be the last answer choice over here. What you could also do for a question like this is just start plugging in. So let's say I plug in choice c. Choice c is no good because if I do 3 times 4, so I have 3 times 4 here. I have to ask myself, is 3 times 4 greater than 12? This is not true because 12 is not greater than itself. 12 is equal to 12. So that's why choice C is out. And we could also plug in these two answer choices to show that those are not true. Choice D is definitely our answer. Question 4. A coordinate plane can be used to show the distance in units between two locations. The location of Jack's house and a store are listed below. We have Jack's house is located at negative 7, negative 8, and the store is located at negative 7, 4. And we want to know what is the distance in units between Jack's house and the store. So for this question, if we have scrap graph paper, that would be awesome. Otherwise, we could just sketch this out ourselves. So I'm just going to draw an xy axis like this. So I'm going to call this the x, and I'm going to call this the y up here. And now the point negative 7, negative 8. Remember, we go in the x direction, then the y direction. So we start at 0, 0, the origin, and we're going to the left 7, and we're going down 8. So this is just a sketch. I'm not actually going to measure this out here. This is just to give us an idea of what's going on in the question. So we're going to the first point is at negative 7, negative 8, and this represents Jack's house. Now the next point is at negative 7, 4. So this time around, we would go in the x direction, negative 7, and then we go in the y direction 4. So we're going to the left 7 and then up 4. So we'll say that's somewhere over here. Okay, so this represents the store. And if we want to find the distance between these two, if we had a piece of graph paper in front of us, what we could do is we could just count out the boxes. So that's just one option here if we wanted to use the graph paper. And then you could just count. We would have to go up 8 and then up 4, and that would tell us that the distance is going to be 12 here. Another thing to notice is that the store and the house are on the same vertical axis here. So in this case, what we could do is we can count the boxes or we could just subtract. We could do 4 minus negative 8. We do the top value minus the bottom value. And this is going to change to 4 plus 8. And this is going to give us 12. So you could either count the boxes going up like this, going from negative 8 to 4. Or you could just subtract the top number minus the bottom number. Either way, you're going to get choice C. Question 11, which number line represents x is greater than or equal to negative 3? So for this one, because we have the equal to underneath like this, this tells us that the circle is going to be filled in. So we could eliminate choices C and D. And now because it's x greater than or equal to negative 3, this tells us we're going to be shading to the right of negative 3 like this. Okay, so the way I like to remember it, when we have x is greater than or less than, the symbol the direction that the arrow is facing tells you which direction to color. So that's how I know it's going to be choice B and not choice A. Choice A, if I were to write out the inequality for this, would be X is less than or equal to negative 3 because all the X values to the left of negative 3 are shaded in. And then these two answer choices here, this would be X is strictly less than negative 3. 
That's why we have this open circle here. And then choice D would be X is greater than negative three like this. So choice B is our answer. Question 14, we have to know our order of operations. So I'm gonna write out PEMDAS. Some students like to memorize this using, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. But in math, the terms that these represent, we have parentheses, exponents, multiplication, division, addition, subtraction. So here we don't have any parentheses, but we do have exponents. So the first thing we're gonna do is evaluate the exponent terms here. So eight to the second power, just know that this means that we're gonna do eight times eight. And eight times eight is equal to 64. So we could start off by saying 64 divided by, and then we have four times, and notice we have another exponent term here. We have two to the third power. And the exponent three tells us to multiply two by itself three times. So we have two times two times two, which is equal to eight. So now we have four times eight like this. And now one thing we could do is when we get down to this part here, multiplication and division, these are the same rank. So from this point on, we could just move from left to right and just do 64 divided by four and then multiply that result by eight. So we're gonna go here and do 64 divided by four and 64 divided by four is equal to 16. Now, if that's math you don't want to do in your head, what you could do is just do the long division on the side because this part of the test, we do not get a calculator. So six goes in, uh, six divided by four, we're going to get one because if we did four times two, that would bring us to eight, which would go past six. Okay, so we could get as close as four times one. So now we subtract the four, we have a remainder of two. We bring down this four and four goes into 24 six times and then six times four is 24. We subtract and it divides evenly. Okay, so we have 16 and now times eight like this. So then from this point on, we're gonna do 16 times eight. So all we have to do here is just multiply, we'll do this on the side, 16 times eight, and we're gonna have eight times six is 48. We carry the four, and then we have eight times one is eight, and then plus four is 12. So we get 128. Choice D is our answer. Now, one thing I really wanna point out here, please be very careful. It's very tempting students look at this and say, oh, I have to do the division after I do my multiplication. So they might look at this and go 64 divided by, and they do four times eight first is 32, and then they do 64 divided by 32 is equal to two. But notice that this is not even an answer choice to tempt you with, okay? They were polite here to make this not an answer, but just know that you don't follow this exactly multiplication and division have the same rank, so do addition and subtraction. And what that means is if multiplication and division are the only operations left, then you just go from left to right. And the same thing with addition and subtraction. Question 15, Ben purchases one and one fourth pounds of nuts and puts them into bags. Each bag holds one eighth of a pound of nuts and he uses all the nuts to fill each bag completely. How many bags does Ben fill with nuts? So here we're gonna do division, okay? We have the total here, and we have the amount that goes into each bag, okay? So this is the, the total, and this is the amount we're gonna be dividing by here. So Ben purchases a total of one and one-fourth pounds, and he is grouping this into bags that hold one-eighth of a pound, okay? So that's why we're gonna be dividing here. And for this, what we're gonna do is we're gonna turn one and one-fourth into an improper fraction so that we could do the division. So here I'm gonna do four times one is four. So we have four times one is four. And then plus, we're gonna add the one up here. So I'm just gonna make this a little neater. Then we do plus one and we're dividing this by four. So we have this, all of this now divided by one eighth. Okay, so we're just turning one and one fourth into an improper fraction. So now we could say that this is five over four divided by one eighth. And now when you divide fractions, use the technique keep change flip. So we're gonna keep five over four. So we could say now this is equal to five over four. And then we change the operation to multiplication. And then we flip the second fraction. We find the reciprocal. So we're gonna flip this to eight over one. And now from here, we can multiply across and then divide. Or a nice little trick here is to do eight divided by four is two. So I have eight divided by four is two. And then five times two is 10. And then we're left with just one on bottom and 10 divided by one is 10. Okay, you can at this step, some students prefer to just multiply it across and just do five over four times eight over one like this. And they do five times eight is 40 and then divided by four times one is four. And you get the same answer of 10. But me personally, I like to cross cancel first 
because it makes the numbers smaller and that makes the division at the end easier. But either way, we're gonna get choice D. 10 is our answer. Question 18, which expression represents the opposite of the number negative two and a half? So for this one here, when we're looking for the opposite, we're just changing the sign of the number. Now, what makes this question maybe a little bit tricky is you say, oh, the opposite would be positive two and a half. And notice there are no answers that just have this positive expression here. But the way that we take the opposite of a number is we put a negative sign in front of it. So that's why choice B is our answer. If you think about choice B, what this is really saying is this is saying negative one times negative two and a half. And when we multiply two negatives together, we get a positive. And when we multiply by one, it doesn't change the value of this part of the number. So that's why we could just say this is equal to two and a half which is the opposite of negative two and a half. So choice B is definitely our answer. Question 20, a diagram of a cube is shown below and we wanna know what is the volume in cubic inches of the cube? So the formula for finding the volume of a cube, we have volume equals the side length to the third power. So we're gonna take two and a half inches and raise it to the third power. But first what I wanna do is turn two and a half, this mixed number, I wanna turn it into an improper fraction. So we're gonna do two times two and then we're gonna add the numerator here. We're gonna add this one, okay? And this is over, the denominator is two. So this, now we have four plus one is five over two. So five over two represents the side length as an improper fraction. So now we could say that the volume is equal to five over two to the third power. And when we raise something to the third power, we multiply it by itself three times. So we have five over two times five over two times five over two. And now from here, I'm just gonna work this out. We have five times five is 25, and 25 times five is 125. Okay, so the math that I'm doing in my head, just so we're clear on where this number comes from, because we're doing this without a calculator. I'm doing, when I do five times five times five, I'm just doing five times five is 25, and then times another five is 125. So I have 125 over two times two is four, and then four times two is eight. And now from here, I just have to do the division. So I'm gonna have to do long division here because once again, I don't have a calculator to use. So 125 divided by eight, eight goes into 12 once, one times eight is eight, I subtract, I have a remainder of four, and I bring down the five, eight goes into 45, five times, and when we do five times eight, we get 40. I'll just make a little bit of space. And then from here, I have a remainder of five. So I have 15 and my remainder is five and I was originally dividing by eight. So this tells us here the volume is gonna be 15 and 5 eighths cubic inches. So this is gonna match up with choice C. Question 22, Tammy and Jacob collect stamps. Tammy has S stamps and Jacob has four fewer than three times the number of stamps Tammy has. Which expression can be used to represent the number of stamps Jacob has? So for this question, just be very careful. It's tempting to just rush through this and say four fewer than means minus and then say three times the number of stamps Tammy has is S, and then just circling choice C. <laughs> but be careful, choice C is a very dangerous bear trap. You have to know that when you hear four fewer than, yes, we're going to subtract, but we also have to flip these terms here, okay? Four fewer than means we subtract four after what we have in this part here. So three times the number of stamps Tammy has. Tammy has S stamps, so we have three S and four fewer than this would be minus four after the fact. Okay, so that's gonna tell us choice B is our answer. But just once again, just be careful with this one. When they say fewer than, you have to tack the minus four on at the end. So choice B is our answer. Question 23, a container holds six gallons of liquid and we wanna know how many pints of liquid does the container hold? So for this question, we have to know that one gallon is equal to four quarts. And then the next conversion we have to know is that one quart is equal to two pints. Okay, so from here, there's a few ways that we could deal with this, but let's set up a proportion to work this out. So if one gallon is equal to four quarts, we wanna know how many quarts are there in six gallons first. Okay, so I'm just gonna put X quarts. Now for this one, you might just see, oh, one times six is six, so four times six is 24. If you could just do that math in your head, then great. Otherwise, cross multiplying works nicely. So we do one times X is X, and then four times six gives us the 24 over here like this. 
So there are 24 quarts in six gallons. But now the next thing we have to use is this one. If there's for every one quart, two pints, then how many pints are there for 24 quarts? Because we just found out that X was equal to 24. So we have 24 quarts. And from here, what we could do is I'll use a different letter. I'll use Y this time. So we have Y pints. And now all we have to do, just make that a little bit neater, is we're going to cross multiply. Okay, so we have Y pints we're looking for. So 1 times Y is Y. And this is equal to 2 times 24 is 48. So we have 48 pints. Now, one thing to be very, very careful with when you're doing proportions is if you do gallons over quarts, please make sure that you keep the units consistent, that you write gallons over quarts. So it doesn't matter if I wrote four quarts over a gallon or if I write it this way, but I just have to be consistent when I set up my second ratio to the right. Okay, so in this case here, what we have is choice D, 48 pints. Question 26, what ordered pair represents the location of a point that is the reflection of the point negative four, six over the X axis? So for this one, if you know all the rules for reflections, then great. Otherwise, if you forget, then go with the conceptual approach. I would just sketch this out and I have my X, Y axis over here. And first I'm going to plot the point negative four, six. So I'm going to go to the left one, two, three, four. So there's negative four and we're going to go up one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. So this is the point negative four, six over here. Remember I go in the X direction and then I go in the Y direction. I go to the left four and then up six. When we reflect over the X axis, that tells us to use this line over here as our mirror line. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to count the space going to the line of reflection. And then I'm going to go that same distance directly across. Okay. At a 90 degree angle. So I'm going to go down one, two, three, four, five, six. So that means I have to go down another six. I'm going to go one, two, three, four, five, six and plot the point over here. Okay. So this is going to be over here at, let's just write the coordinates. We're going to the left four and we're going down six. So the new coordinates are going to be negative four, negative six. Remember when you're going this way, using the concept or the conceptual approach, what you're going to do is when you're actually writing the coordinates at the end, you're always going to use the origin as your starting point here. So to get to our point of reflection, we're going to the left four down six. So we're going to negative four, negative six. Choice B is our answer. Question 28, an isosceles trapezoid is shown below. And we want to know what is the area in square centimeters of the isosceles trapezoid. So for this question, it helps to know the formula for the area of a trapezoid, which is one half times height times base one plus base two. And we have to be able to identify all of these pieces in this trapezoid. The bases are the sides that are parallel. So notice that these two sides are going in the same direction. So they are parallel. So I could call this one base one and I'll call this one base two. The height of a trapezoid is the distance between the parallel sides. So that's this distance over here, the 15. And the important detail though that we have to note is that the 90 degree angle tells us that this is the height. Because some students might say, wait a minute, can't this be the height? Because these two lines connect the parallel sides. But when you're measuring height, you need to have that 90 degree angle there for this to count as a height. So now we're ready to plug into the formula. So we have the area of this trapezoid is equal to one half times the height is 15. And then we're going to multiply that by the sum of the bases. So we have 16 plus 10. And now we work this out. We'll do parentheses first. So we have the area of this trapezoid is equal to one half times 15. And then we have 16 plus 10 is 26. Now, one thing that jumps out at me here is that 26 is even and we're multiplying by a half. So I'm going to choose to multiply 26 by a half because that's going to give us a nice whole number. If I do one half times 15, that's still fine. But then I have to work with decimals, which makes this question a little bit more challenging. So 26 times a half or half of 26 is 13. So now I have 13 times 15. And for this, I'll just do the long multiplication on the side, 15 times 13. So we work this out. Three times five is 15. We carry the one. Three times one is three plus one is four. And now we put a placeholder here and we multiply from the tens place. One times five is five and one times one is one. And now we just add this up. We have five plus zero is five. Four plus five is nine. And then the one just carries down. So our solution here is choice C. The area in square centimeters is 195.
Question 29 in inequality is shown below. We have negative 9 over 20 is greater than negative 21 over 24. And we want to know which statement about the locations of the number on a number line is true. Well, one thing we could think about first is if we had something easy. So first I want to talk about something easy. And let's say I had this part of the number line. Let's say I'm looking at 4, 5, 6, 7. And I make a statement like this. 7 is greater than 4, which is clearly true. But think about the location of 7 relative to 4. 7 is to the right of 4. So anytime you have a situation where a number is greater than another number, that number is located to the right. So here, if negative 9 over 20 is greater than this number, that means it's going to be to the right, which means we could eliminate choices A and C. But now let's think about the rest of the sentence. Both of them say, and to the. So these numbers here, we have to think, are they to the left of 0 or to the right of 0? Well, since these are negative numbers, this tells us here that the numbers are going to be to the left of 0 on the number line. So just looking at what's left, I could see choice B is going to be our answer. But if we want to have a stronger visual of this, what we could do is just sketch this out. And I'm going to say 0 is, let's say, over here. And I'm going to put negative 1 over here. So negative 21 over 24 is really close to negative 1. Okay, let's just say that this is over here, negative 21 over 24. And the reason why it's really close is that 21 is less than 24, but it's pretty close to 24. So that's how I know like this fraction here. Just imagine you had a pizza with 24 slices. If you ate 21 of them, you ate almost the whole pie. So that's how I know it's close to negative 1. But now something like negative 9 over 20, I look at negative 1 half is over here. But another way I could write negative 1 half is I could call this negative 10 over 20. So something like negative 9 over 20 is slightly to the right of negative half. Okay, so that's how I know it. negative 9 over 20. I'm not drawing this exactly to scale, but it's going to be somewhere over here. So that's how we could also see why negative 9 over 20, that this number is greater than this number. It's to the right. And you could see that both of these numbers are clearly to the left of 0 because they're in the negative here. So choice B is our answer. So now we're moving on to the session two questions. And for these, we get to use a scientific calculator. Question 31, there are 104 calories in an eight ounce serving of soda. And we wanna know how many calories are in one ounce of soda. So if we set this ratio up over here, we have 104 calories. And then I'm setting this up here over eight ounces. Okay, so it's 104 calories for every eight ounces. And we wanna know how many calories there are in one ounce of soda. Well, for this one here, just think of this as we're reducing this fraction. So I'm just going to divide the top and bottom by 8. And if I divide the bottom by 8, 8 divided by 8 is 1. So this will tell us how many calories we have in 1 ounce of soda. So now we could just type in 104 divided by 8. And this is going to give us the numerator of our new fraction. 104 divided by 8 was 13. So there are 13 calories in 1 ounce of soda. Choice A is our answer. Question 32, Jose builds a skateboard ramp in the shape of a right triangular prism. The net below shows the dimensions of each part of the ramp. And we want to know what is the surface area in square feet of the ramp. So for this question here, what we have to do is find the area of all of these shapes and then add them all up together. Okay, so what we have is we have three rectangles here and two triangles, all right, two right triangles. So now what we need to know is the area of a rectangle is length times width. And then the area of a triangle, we could find using the formula 1 half base times height. So what I'm going to do here is just find these missing values. We were told over here that this distance is 4. So over here, I could label this distance as 4 feet. And now looking inside here, we have this distance going across as 6 feet. So I could say that this distance over here is also 6 feet. And then over here, we have another rectangle, but now we have enough stuff to find what we need. So I'm going to find the area of this first rectangle over here. So I'm just going to do the length times the width. So the units here, we don't actually have to write. We just have to find the numerical value here. The units, though, at the end are square feet. So the area of the first rectangle, we're going to do 4 times 2.5. Okay, so we're doing 4 times 2.5. And then we're going to add the area of the second rectangle, well, notice here that this rectangle is going across 6, and this distance over here is also 4 feet. Okay, so we have 4 times 2.5, and, and then we're going to add 4 times 6. And then next, 
we have this rectangle over here is four times six and a half. Okay, so four times 6.5. And then the next thing we have to find here, so we found the area of these three rectangles is the area of the two triangles. Well, the formula for the area of a triangle is one half base times height. So we're gonna do one half and the base of this triangle here, we're gonna say is six feet. Okay, so I'll start with this triangle up top. So we have one half times six and then times 2.5. Now, one thing to point out here is that these two triangles are identical. See how they have the same base and height and there's a right angle between them. But one thing I wanna point out here is that this value over here is a distraction, okay? The 6.5 we're not gonna use because this we're not gonna use for the base or height because there's not a 90 degree angle separating this value from this one here or this one here. The right angle connects the side that's two and a half feet with the side that's six feet long, okay? So when you're identifying the base and height, you want there to be a 90 degree angle between the two of them, okay? So this right angle here is very, very important. So we have one half times six times 2.5, and now just make a little bit of space. The other right triangle has the exact same dimensions, okay? So we found the area of the right triangle above. We're gonna find the area of the right triangle below. So that's another one half times six times 2.5. And now from here, what we're gonna do is just work all this out. Okay, so four times two and a half, we could use a calculator for this. It's gonna give us 10 plus, and then we have four times six is 24. If we wanna work out four times 6.5 is 26. And then here, if I was doing this without a calculator, I'm gonna take half of six, and that's gonna give me three. And then three times 2.5 is gonna give us 7.5. Okay, I just think of three quarters is 75 cents. So that's kind of how I know to just do three times 2.5 is 7.5. And then plus, same idea with this one. Half of six is still three, and three times 2.5 is 7.5. Okay, and if I'm doing this without a calculator, once again, I'm just gonna do this in groups. So 24 plus 26, I'm seeing four plus six is 10, and then 20 plus 20 is 40, 40 plus 10 is 50. And then we have plus 10 over here and then plus seven and a half plus seven and a half is 15. And now I just add this up. I have 60 plus 15 is 75. All right, let me just actually write equals here. So this is equal to 75 when we add all this up. So choice B is our answer. Question 33, the number four is 16% of what number? So for this question, I'm gonna show two approaches, but the first approach is gonna be setting up a proportion. So 16% is 16 out of 100. Okay, that is the meaning of 16%. And now I'm gonna set this equal to four over X. And the reason being, they're saying here the number four is 16% of what number? So four represents the small value, the part, and the mystery number is the whole thing that we're looking for. Okay, so this proportion method works very nicely. And one thing we could do before we cross multiply is we could reduce the fraction over here. I'm gonna divide the top and bottom by four. And that's gonna make the algebra a little bit easier. So here, now we have four over X equals, and I'm doing 16 divided by four is four, and then 100 divided by four is 25. And notice that my numerators are equal. So right away, I could see that the mystery value is gonna to have to be 25. But if I did wanna do the algebra here, I could just cross multiply, and I would have four times X is equal to 25 times four is 100. And then from here, to solve for x, I have four times x equals 100. And the opposite of multiplying by four would be to divide by four. But the golden rule of algebra is whatever you do to the left side of an equation, you have to do to the right side of the equation. Okay, so here I'm gonna divide both sides by four and that would tell me x is equal to 100 divided by four is 25. The second approach involves using algebra directly. So here, what I would look at is the word is in math means equals, okay? So this says equals, and the word of tells you to multiply. And then the mystery number, we're just gonna call X. So I'm gonna say the mystery number, what number? We're gonna call that X. So now I just translate this into an equation. Four is, so I have four equals. 16% is 16 over 100. And now of means multiply, so times and then the mystery number here is X. So I could reduce this fraction again, just like I did with the first method, and I could say four is equal to, and I have four over 25, 
times x. But now to solve for x, I have 4 over 25 times x. The opposite of multiplying by 4 over 25 would be to divide by 4 over 25. But I would have to do this to both sides. And now watch what happens. I'm going to use our dividing fractions technique, keep change flip. So I'm going to keep the numerator. I'm going to keep 4. I'm going to change this operation from division to multiplication. And I'm going to flip the fraction on bottom to 25 over 4. And notice here that I have 4 over 4. 4 divided by 4 is 1. This cancels. And that would just tell us that x is equal to 25. I get the same exact answer, choice C. Question 34, a machine produces chocolates at a constant rate. In 42 minutes, the machine produces 7 pounds of chocolates. How long in minutes will it take the machine to produce 9 pounds of chocolates? So for this question here, the million dollar phrase is constant rate. This allows us to set up a proportion to solve the question. So what we have here is that it takes 42 minutes for the machine to make 7 pounds of chocolates. Okay, so we have 42 over seven like this. And I'm putting the units here. We have minutes over pounds. Now, what we could do with this is we could set up the ratio on the right side, and we're gonna go minutes and pounds like this. And what we have is we're looking for how much time it takes to produce nine pounds of chocolates. So nine is gonna go on bottom where the pounds are, and the mystery value we're looking for, I'm gonna call it X, is gonna go next to minutes. So then from here, what we could do is we could just cross multiply. And what we're gonna have is we have seven times X is seven X, and this is equal to, we have 42 times nine. So now we just work out the multiplication. You could use a calculator for this. We have 42 times nine is 378. And now from here to solve for X, we're just gonna divide both sides by seven. And once again, we could just use a calculator for this part, or we could do the division ourselves. But if you do get a calculator, I would at least check your answer with the calculator. But if I wanna do this by hand, I'm gonna say seven goes into 37 five times, okay? Seven times five is 35, and that would bring us two away from 37. I would have a remainder of two, and then seven goes into 28 four times. So our answer here is going to be 54. There is other stuff that we could do here. One thing we could have done is reduce this first. If I did 42 minutes over seven pounds, 42 divided by seven, so this is the alternate way to do this, but if I do 42 divided by seven is six, that tells us that the machine every six minutes will make one pound of chocolate. So if we wanna know how long it's gonna to take to make nine pounds of chocolate, we just multiply this value here six by nine and we would get 54. Okay, so that's just another approach here where the multiplication and division is not as tricky, but setting up the proportion will work fine. We're gonna get choice C. Question 35, the dimensions of a cereal box in the shape of a right rectangular prism are shown below. And we wanna know what is the volume in cubic inches of the cereal box? So for this question, we have to know that the volume of a right rectangular prism, we could find by doing the length times the width times the height. And the dimensions they gave us here are the length, width, and height. So these we could just plug right into the formula. Now, one thing here is this could be pretty annoying to do by hand, but we do get a calculator. So if we are going to use the calculator, it helps to know how do we type in mixed numbers into the calculator. And the concept that we would need to know, so I just want to point out one thing here, is that, and I'll just make this a little bit neater. So the concept that we need is that a number like 8 and 1 tenth this is the same thing as eight plus one over 10. Okay, so when we type it into the calculator, we're gonna type it in like this, eight plus one over 10, and that's gonna help us find the volume. So on the scientific calculator, you can use parentheses like this, and then write eight and one tenth as eight plus one over 10. And one over 10, I'm just gonna press one divided by 10. Okay, so this is gonna represent eight and one tenth, and I'm gonna multiply that by four and four fifths which is four plus, and then I have four over five. If you wanna turn these into decimal values, you can, but this is just a way of typing in mixed numbers on the calculator screen. And now 12 and a half is the same thing as 12 plus one over two. All right, and now I work this out. I press enter, and this multiplies to 486. So our solution here is gonna be choice D. Question 36, a tutoring company charges $25 per hour to tutor a student. How many hours of tutoring would cost $62.50? Now, 
Now for this question, if you just understand to divide these numbers here to do 6250 divided by 25, then excellent. If you divide these two here, you're going to get 2.5 if you type this in a calculator. And the answer is gonna be choice A. If this doesn't make sense intuitively, what you could do is set up a proportion. So it's $25 for one hour of tutoring. And we wanna know how many hours of tutoring would cost $62.50. Okay, so 6250 I put here, money is going up top. And we wanna know, and let me just fix that. So $62.50, we wanna know how many hours is this going to take to make that much money. So if we cross multiply here, we have 25 times X is equal to 62.50 times one is 62.50. And then to solve for X, we have times 25 attached to X. We would do the opposite, which would be to divide by 25. And you could see here, this creates the division problem, 6250 divided by 25, which gives us 2.5. And two and a half is the same thing as this mixed number over here. So choice A is our answer. Question 37, the four vertices of a parallelogram are plotted on the coordinate plane shown below. And we wanna know what is the distance in units between vertices A and D? So for this one here, let's just go from A to D. We could just count the boxes. So we're going one, two, three, four, five. So the distance is five. No, this is a very, very dangerous bear trap. We have to pay attention to the scale here. Notice that the X axis, as we move from one box to the next, that we're actually counting by twos. So when we skip here, we're gonna have to count by, but we're gonna have to count by twos. So we're gonna go two, four, six, eight, 10. Okay, we're gonna go plus two each time. So here, we're just, once again, we're going plus two each of the times here from one box to the next. So if we're going plus two all the way across like this, we're doing plus two five times, that is a distance of 10, all right? And this question is just worth one credit. So the work that we show here is fine. This is gonna get us the full credit. So we'll just say the distance is 10 units. Question 38, what value of N makes the equation N over eight equals 17 true? So for this one, what we could do is we could just say N over eight equals 17 over one. Anytime you have a whole number, you could write that whole number as that number over one, and it's gonna be equal to the same thing. So now what we could do from here is just cross multiply. So I'm doing n times one, and n times one, I'm just gonna write like this, n times one, which is equal to n, and now we have equals, we're gonna do eight times 17, okay? So we have eight times 17. And now from here, we just have to work this out. We do get a calculator for this part of the test. Otherwise, if you just wanna do this by hand and check with the calculator, eight times seven is 56, you carry the five. Eight times one is eight, plus five is 13. So N would be equal to 136. And this is our solution to question 38. So we have 136. Question 39, an artist uses a ratio of six gallons of orange paint to eight gallons of blue paint. If the artist uses one gallon of blue paint, how many gallons of orange paint will they use? So for this one here, let's set up the ratio. We have six gallons of orange. So I'm just gonna abbreviate orange with OR like this and then we have eight gallons of blue paint. So I'm just abbreviating so that when we set up the next ratio in our proportion, we know where it belongs. So next we have the artist uses one gallon of blue paint. So the one gallon of blue paint is gonna go on the bottom here, and we wanna know how many gallons of orange paint will they use. So orange is on top, so I'm gonna put an X here. This is the mystery value that we're looking for. So from here, we could just do eight times X is eight X and set this equal to, we have six times one is six. And now to solve for X, we have eight times X. The opposite of multiplying by eight would be to divide by eight, but we have to do that to both sides. So this tells us here that X is equal to six over eight, but we should reduce our fractions here. So we're gonna divide the top and bottom by two, and this is gonna work out to three over four. If you do this in the calculator and you get 0 0.75, just know that both of these answers are acceptable, but I'm just gonna go ahead and write 3 fourths at the bottom. Our solution is gonna be 3 fourths gallons. Question 40, a diagram of a rectangular flag with a shaded section is shown below. What is the area in square centimeters of the shaded section of the flag? 
So for this question, we're going to use two formulas. We're going to use the formula for the area of a rectangle, which is length times width. And then we're going to use the formula for the area of a triangle, which is one half base times height. And what we're going to do is we're going to find the area of this big rectangle here, and we're going to find the area of this triangle and we're going to subtract the two. Okay. Cause notice that this shaded section is the leftover area from the rectangle after the triangle has been cut out. So let's just go ahead and find these areas. So the area of the rectangle we're going to just work out here is going to be nine centimeters times five centimeters. Now we don't actually have to write the units in the question, but just know if I were to do nine centimeters times five centimeters, that would be 45 square centimeters. But for this test, you can just say nine times five is equal to 45. And the units are just included in the space down below where you write your answer. So this is the area of the rectangle. Now for the area of the triangle, I'll just write that over here. The area of the triangle is one half and then the base is five centimeters. So I'm doing one half times five. And then I'm going to multiply that by the height, which is 4.5. Now I know that this is a base and a height because there is a right angle separating these two. Okay. If that right angle is not there, we can't assume that this is the height going to this base over here. So I'm doing one half times five times 4.5. So this part I could just type directly in the calculator. If you just know that one half is 0 0.5, then excellent. Otherwise, if you do one divided by two, you're going to get 0 0.5. So I could do 0 0.5 times five times 4.5. And this is going to give us the area of the triangle. So we'll just write this down. The area of the triangle is 11.25 square centimeters. But once again, we'll just leave the units out for now because at the end they have that in the space where we write our answer. So now to find the area of the shaded section, we're just going to subtract these two. Okay. We're going to do 45 minus 11.25. And for this, we can just use a calculator, but if we want to practice long subtraction and then check our answer, I'm going to put a decimal with two zeros here and I'm going to have to borrow from the five here, make this a four. I put a 10 here and I borrow and make this a nine and I put my 10 here. 10 minus five is five, nine minus two is seven, four minus one is three. I'm gonna put the decimal down here and then four minus one is three. So the area of the shaded section is 33.75 square centimeters. So we'll just write that over here, 33.75 and we have square centimeters. Question 41, a student claims that the expression six plus eight X is equivalent to the expression three times three plus five X. What is incorrect about the student's claim? Be sure to include an equivalent expression to three times three plus five X in your response. And we have to explain our answer. So for this one here, just looking at this expression, if we actually work it out, we have to use the distributive property. So we're going to do three times three, which is nine plus, and then we do three times five X. But just know when you're doing something like three times five X, sometimes students get tripped up by this but you're just going to multiply the numbers here. So when you do three times five X, I'm doing three times five is 15. And then the X just tags along. So I'm going to have plus 15 X at the end. And notice right away that this does not match the students claim that it works out to six plus eight X. So now let's think about what did they do? Well, if we look here, if we were to add three, three plus three is six. And if we did three plus five, we would get eight. So it looks like what this student did here was they just added three to the numbers inside the parentheses instead of distributing by multiplication. Notice in the explanation, I did explain what the student did wrong. I explained how they added the three to the three and the five. And then I showed the correct work here using the distributive property to get to nine plus 15 X question 42. Mike needs a ticket every time he rides the bus. Given the equation C equals 2.75 times T. What is the relationship between T the number of tickets that Mike buys and C the total cost. And we have to be sure to identify which variable is independent and which variable is dependent in our answer. We also have to explain our answer. So I want to make a table over here for T and C, and this is going to help us bring the question to life. So T represents the number of tickets that Mike buys. So I'm going to put zero, one, two, three here. And C is the total cost. 
Well, if I just plug in zero, 2.75 times zero, if I plug in T equals zero, gives us a total cost of zero dollars, which makes sense. If Mike buys no tickets, he's gonna pay no money. And then if we have T equals one, 2.75 times one would just give us 2.75. So this tells us the cost of one ticket is $2.75. If we plug in two, so if we did times two here, we could see that 2.75 times two, we could use a calculator, is 5.50. So this tells us that two tickets would cost $5.50. And if I just do one more, if I add another 275 here, this is gonna bring us to a total of 825. So now let's think about what's going on here. We wanna know the relationship between T, the number of tickets that Mike buys, and C, the total cost. Well, as T increases, C increases, and also there is a direct relationship between T and C. They are directly proportional here. So as Mike buys more tickets, each ticket is $2.75. So we just have to multiply T by 2.75 to get the total cost. So now in our explanation, we have to talk about which variable here is independent and which variable is dependent. Well, think about it carefully. The total cost depends on how many tickets Mike buys. Okay, so this would be the dependent variable because once again, the total cost depends on how many tickets Mike buys. So then this would be the independent variable. So this is going to go into our explanation here. Question 43, a student claims that four is the greatest common factor of 24 and 40 because the two numbers are both multiples of four. Is the student's claim correct? And we have to explain how we determined our answer. So for this question, what we could do is find the prime factorization of 24 and 40, and that'll tell us definitively what the greatest common factor of those two numbers are. So I'm gonna break down 24. I'm gonna write it as two times 12. And then I just keep breaking this down until I get all primes because two is prime. And now I would break this down 12 to two times six, and we have a prime number two, and then we could break down six to two times three, and we're gonna have two prime numbers here. So this would give us the prime factorization of 24. I have two times two times two is two to the third power, and then times three. Okay, so the prime factorization of 24 is two to the third power times three. And now if we do the prime factorization of 40, we just break this down, we have two times 20. Two is prime, so I'll just circle it, and then 20 breaks down to two times 10, so I'll circle this, and then 10 breaks down to two times five, so I'll circle these two prime factors. The prime factorization of 40 is two to the third power times five. So when you're looking for a greatest common factor from the prime factorization of the two numbers, what you're gonna do is look for all the factors they have in common. So notice that they have a two to the third power in common, but then that's it. The three doesn't match the five, so we could only select two to the third power. So the greatest common factor here of 24 and 40 is equal to two to the third power. And if I work this out, two times two times two is equal to eight. Okay, so is the student's claim correct? No, and how do we know they're not correct? Well, they're incorrect because the greatest common factor is eight. And how do we determine our answer? We use prime factorization. Question 44, a prism made of unit cubes is shown below. What perfect cube is represented by the volume of the prism? Be sure to include what you know about volume and exponents in your answer. And we have to explain our answer. So here we have a cube, and the formula we're gonna to use to find the volume of the cube is volume equals s to the third power, where s is the length of the side of the cube. So here we just have to count the boxes. Going across, we're going across one, two, three, four. So the length of the cube is four units. And if you just wanna double check that it's the same all the way around, you can see going back is one, two, three, four, and going up is one, two, three, four. So now if we just plug into this formula here, we'll see that the volume is equal to four to the third power. And if we work this out, this is four times four times four, and four times four times four, we could use a calculator or we could break it down piece by piece 
we do 4 times 4 is 16, and 16 times 4 is 64. So let's think about this now. What perfect cube is represented by the volume of the prism? That's going to be the number 64. And we have to be sure to include what we know about volume and exponents in our answer. So we're just going to say here that we used the volume formula to figure out that the perfect cube was 64. Question 45, the location of Jake's school and house are represented on the coordinate plane shown below. And we want to know what is the distance in units from Jake's school to his house. And we have to be sure to include the coordinates for both locations and how those coordinates can be used to determine our answer. And we have to explain how we determined our answer. So for this one here, this question, we could just count the boxes to get from Jake's house to his school and just... Note here, we're going one, two, three, four units, okay? We're hopping one, two, three, four times, okay? So the distance in units is four units. And how do we know? Well, we could see here that we're just going down four units from the point, I'll label the point over here. This is the point three, six. So we're going down four units from three, six to get to the point over here, which is the point three, two. Okay, so we're going from three, six to three, two. And you could even see here, if we pay attention to the y value, 6 minus 4 is equal to 2. So the number 4 is looking real good here. And we're able to do this because we're going straight down, okay? If you're going left or right, up or down, you could just count the boxes. If you're going on a diagonal, it's a little bit more complicated. But for this question here, we're just going 4 units south from Jake's house. Question 46, Rex and Nero are saving money for new bikes. They both start with $0 and save at a constant rate for 16 months. The tables below show Rex's and Nero's total savings in dollars at the end of different numbers of months. And what we want to know is at the end of 16 months, what is the difference between the amount of money Rex saved and the amount of money Nero saved? So for this question here, the million dollar phrase is that the money is being saved at a constant rate. That means that the money in the account is going up by the same amount each month. So here, what we could do is, if we want to know what's going on at the end of 16 months, so this is the time we care about, we could set up a proportion to help us find this. So here, if we look at Rex's account, this entry here is actually going to help us get to the dollar amount very quickly. So here, notice they tell us that Rex has $72. Okay, so $72, and this is for Rex. So Rex has $72 at the end of eight months. So what we could do is we could just take this one here and multiply the top and bottom by two. And the reason being, if we do eight times two, that's going to bring us to 16 months. Okay, so we'll have 16 months. And how much money is that going to be? Well, if we do $72 times two, that's $144. Okay, so Rex at the end of 16 months is going to have $144. So for Nero, notice here that if we want to get to 16, 3, 6, 9, and 12 are not going to be nice numbers to work with just yet because 16 is not divisible by 3, 6, 9, or 12. So for this one, we could take a different approach for Nero. So for Nero, what I want to do is I want to find the unit rate. So I'm going to take the small amount here. The smallest amount is we have Nero has $36.00 at the end of three months. Okay, so at the end of three months, and maybe I'll just abbreviate this here, I'll just write uh, MO for months. Okay, and I'll just be consistent, I'll do that over here as well. So I'll just get rid of all this extra, and we'll just abbreviate just so, yeah, it's a little bit simpler to write. Okay, so here, $36 in three months, if we divide the top and bottom by three, so I'm gonna divide the top and bottom by three, that tells us that Nero is saving $12 a month. Okay, so this is $12 in one month. So here, if I want to know how much money did Nero save in 16 months, now I could just take this and multiply it by 16 over 16. Okay, so $12 in one month. Now I'm going to go times 16 over 16, and that's going to tell us how much money Nero saved in 16 months. 
So for this part, you can just use a calculator and do 12 times 16. If you want to actually do the work on the side, you can just do 12 times 16 and check with the calculator. So either way is fine. I'll just work out the long multiplication here. So two times six is 12, carry the one. Two times one is two, plus one is three. I put a placeholder and then I have one times six, one times one, and this works out after we add to 192. Okay, so that's $192 at the end of 16 months. So now what we wanna do is find the difference. So now we're gonna subtract these two values here. We're subtracting 192 and 144 to see the difference in the amount of money Rex saved and the amount of money that Nero saved. So we'll just work this out, 192 minus 144. And for this, once again, we could just use a calculator, but I'll just go ahead and do the long subtraction. So I'm gonna borrow from here, do 12 minus four is eight, eight minus four is four, one minus one is zero, so we're gonna stop here, and the difference in the amount of money saved is $48.